Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hi, hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I'm just recording the session so we can load it onto our YouTube channel for those that would like to listen to the audio or watch the video a little bit later. So I think we are three o'clock on the dot, Wednesday, the 17th of March. Um, welcome everybody for those that are going to be joining us today. Uh, today we're chatting about a very interesting topic and something that I think has come across our table um, quite, um, quite often in the last couple of uh, weeks on people wanting advice in terms of how to be supportive to a friend or a family member that has been diagnosed with cancer. So the topic for today is supporting friends or a loved one with cancer. And uh, we are very, very um, blessed to have Professor Michael Herbs from Cancer, which is the Cancer Association of South Africa, join us today to chat about this very interesting topic. Um, Professor Herbs, thank you so much again for taking the time out to share another informative session with us again. Thank you very much for Makisilotimo Cancer Project for having me. It's always a pleasure because it's it's so pleasant to 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 see your faces and to have a chat with you. And I think the idea today is really to 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 have a very interactive. And I hope that uh, as the listeners join in, that uh, they will feel free just to interrupt and and let's really get chatty about this very very important topic. Yes. Uh, I have in my mind about 25 points that uh, I think is of importance that we can talk about, but uh, I won't even number them as we go through. Yep. And uh, if we don't get through to the end, I'll make sure that we do the most important ones and really have a, a rather good understanding of uh, what the whole topic is about. And uh, the first question I want to ask is, what is a friend? of a cancer patient. What is a friend? Uh, I see we've got two people from outside. Yep. Uh, Nicole, I heard you mentioning her name. And then I see uh, Adeshni La Costa is there as well. Any of you, please participate. Unmute your, your mics and uh, let's hear. How do you think, or what do you believe is a true friend of a cancer patient? Or no, let me say a friend. Because after that, I'm going to say, what is a true friend? So let's just hear, what is a friend? Uh, I just think someone who supports a cancer patient right throughout their journey and um, helps them to deal with the situation, but also give them enough space to um, work things out in a way, but when they need it to be there for them. Great. I think, you know, that I actually let the cat out of the bag and uh, mm -hmm. said a true friend, because you're getting down to the basis of really saying what a true friend is. Because I believe that there is a difference between a friend and a true friend. And the friend is yeah. somebody who's friendly and who is around and is willing to assist, etc., etc. But a true friend goes the extra mile. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that is the difference. And I think what we would like to see this afternoon is to convince people if they are a friend to somebody who's got cancer, to rather just not be a friend, an occasional say hi and a whatever, but to be a true friend yeah. and to go that extra mile. And with a wonderful technology today that we have, I want to introduce and say, you know, with a wonderful, if, if WhatsApp is your, your favorite uh, platform, use that or any of the other platforms that is much more convenient to you. Yeah. And I want to say establish little WhatsApp groups, plural, at least two of them. Find out who are the friends of the particular cancer patient that you are targeting. Because we are now talking about a one-on-one -on -one situation. We talk about one cancer patient of whom we want to be a true friend. But uh, I will most probably not be the only true friend of that person. So find out who the other people in the, in the group of friends are. Get them to join a small WhatsApp group. But don't include your cancer-diagnosed uh, friend as part of the WhatsApp group. Because say there are five, six, or seven of you, then we are going to disturb the cancer patient with all messages and things coming through from seven different people. 
And that is the last thing that we want. Then between the small group of you, it is important then to decide who will be or who will take the lead, who will be the contact between the group of friends as far as the WhatsApp uh, group is concerned and the cancer patients. So we as a small group of friends will talk amongst each other and make plans, come up with suggestions, but one of us will be, be taking the lead and we will WhatsApp with our cancer friend to allow him or her to have someone as a friend to contact. And if necessary, I can then go to the other little WhatsApp group and inform the other people in the group. This is something that has come up. Uh, there's, some, there's a new request for A, B, or C. Uh, there's a request for somebody to please come up with uh, uh, arranging transport for and to be able to go and visit her oncologist. But if that message goes through immediately to seven people, and seven people are now problematic in contacting the cancer patient that they all offer, can you imagine the, 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 the well, I want to say the disturbance in the life of the cancer patient. We must remember that cancer patients are affected by their diagnosis. First of all, because many people, even though they will not admit it, they still see this as a possible death sentence. Yeah. And that is always in the back of their mind. Then we must remember the disease itself will cause fatigue. And we had a previous discussion yeah. on cancer fatigue. People who, who joined the group will remember that we spoke about it. And we said that the disease itself can cause fatigue for the patient. Then we must remember that the treatment is an additional thing that can cause fatigue. Whether it be chemotherapy, whether it can be a radiation therapy or a combination of the two, whether it is surgery or whatever else there is, all of this has an impact on the patient. And they are really, though they may not want to admit it, but they do have one or other form of fatigue. So we as friends don't want to increase the fatigue of this friend of ours. So I'll be the leader of the WhatsApp group. I will have another WhatsApp connection just between me and our cancer friend, and I will receive the messages. And I will then relay this to the others in the other group, and we will then discuss amongst ourselves. Instead of seven coming up for transport, we'll say, yes, you, you know, she doesn't only need transport to go to the oncologist on that day at that time, but uh, she will also need to get, have somebody to go to the pharmacy and to pick up the script. Or she will need somebody to run to the grocery shop or whatever it is to collect something for the house. And then we will decide amongst ourselves. And I, as the leader of the group, will come up and say, Anne, look, uh, Susan is going to take you to the oncologist on your date. And don't be concerned over your uh, grocery list. I will get the grocery list from you. And uh, Peter has decided that he will go to the shop on your behalf and he will get all the things that you will need. And I think this is a wonderful way with technology today that we have these two little groups, a one-on-one -on -one group from the leader of the friends and then a group of friends. And we use that as our uh, mode of, of communication because we don't want to... Uh, increase the fatigue of the person. Yeah. I think that is important. Let's go over immediately and then also say that we've got to schedule visits to the patient. That is so, so crucial, really. And the best is that the leader of the group of friends will ask Anne and say, Anne, um, when would you prefer to have uh, people come and visit you. And the best is to have people come and visit during the week and not over weekends. Because weekends are mostly the time that close relatives and so on will want to come in and visit. And then we as outsiders don't want to necessarily uh, interfere and interrupt with the interaction between the patient and her family uh, members. 
and then we schedule, say, oh, Peter will go on Monday uh, between uh, 10 and half past 10, etc. And you'll notice that I am mentioning here a half an hour, and that may even be too long. And that's the other thing that we must arrange within the group. When we go and visit, the visit has to be purposeful, but and it must be meaningful, but it must not be too long. So it, it, it really, you're at 10, 15 minutes, I think is ample time to talk. Yeah. And then during the short visit, oh, I've heard so many things said when people come and visit a cancer patient. Yeah. And let's immediately talk of what are some of the unhelpful things that people very often say to a cancer patient. And they come and visit and they say, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> Unfortunately, nothing can be further from the truth. Yeah. Because even if you are yourself are a cancer survivor, you still don't know how Anne feels. Because Anne is unique. Yeah. She's a totally different individual from what I am. I may be a, an outgoing person and uh, I am far more able to, to, to hide my feelings, etc. When people visit me and say, oh, you know, I'm hunky dory and everything is fine and this, that and the other. But Anne may be more of an introvert and somebody who's at that moment in time of her cancer journey be far more reticent to really be to open up, etc. And then you don't want somebody to say to you, I know how you feel. Because nobody knows how you feel at that moment. Another totally unhelpful uh, thing to say is, do you know, uh, when my aunt Susie, when she had cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the last thing that a cancer patient wants to hear. They don't really hear stories of people that they don't know, that it has no meaning in their life. And it may be something negative that happened to uh, Auntie Susan. Yeah. And we're telling this now to a newly diagnosed, or even if it's not a newly diagnosed person, but somebody else on a cancer journey. They say, oh my goodness, if that could happen to Auntie Susan, now say it happens to me. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be very careful of what we say. Another something that is not helpful at all. Oh, you look so good today. What, what do we mean if we say, you look good today? Or you look different today? Then we are opening up a can of worms. Because we are expecting a response to say, well, you know, I look different, I had my hair cut, or I look different today because I'm very sad. Or I look different because I'm still very angry because of my diagnosis. I haven't accepted it yet. So we don't talk about how you look, etc. Another something not to say is, oh, you're so brave. How do we know? Anne may just be putting up a front. She doesn't want us at that moment in time to get too emotive or too sympathetic. Because remember, a cancer patient needs no sympathy. They need empathy. So sympathy is the one where when emotions start running into the whole thing. So sympathy has no place. And if we say, oh, you're so brave, or you're so strong, or you look different today, then we are sort of asking a response. And we don't want to do that. Another something, and I think that's about the last thing that I have to say about something that we should never say, is that is, oh, I'm sure you're going to be fine. And this very often is said at the end of our little conversation, when we get to the end and we're ready to say goodbye and say, oh, and don't worry, I'm sure you're going to be fine. How do we know that Anne is going to be fine the moment I walk out of that room? The moment I walk out of that dream, Anne may be so overcome with emotion or thankfulness or whatever, and then she doesn't feel fine at all. And because she's not feeling fine, and I'm saying to you, you are going to be fine, then she feels guilty. And this increases, again, the anxiety and the fatigue of that person.
So our conversations are so, so important. And I think that's why I wanted to get this off my little list. Yeah. And first to get that off the list, because it is so important that we do not uh, increase the fatigue of somebody who's in, on their cancer journey. Yeah. Then I think uh, we can start talking about the visits. We've already mentioned that we will, amongst the group, decide who will go and visit when. But the leader of the group will be the one, and we don't, when we've made up our little list, we don't go to the patient and say, oh, you know, uh, Peter will come on Monday, Susan will come on Tuesday, uh, George said he'll be there on Wednesday, and uh, so on. Don't overload. Know when Anne wants to receive visitors. And then you schedule with the friends, and you say, look, I will get back to each of you, and I will inform you whether Anne will be ready to see you Monday at 9 o'clock, even though she prefers to have visitors at 9 o'clock. Then we make sure that Anne is fine Monday morning at 9 o'clock. And you make sure about that about half an hour or an hour before the time. And you then contact Peter to say, Peter, yes, uh, Susan will be expecting you Oh, Anne will be expecting you at nine o'clock. So it's very important that we schedule the meetings and nobody as friends should go and visit a cancer patient unless they have an appointment. That is so important because the life of a person on a cancer journey needs to be scheduled. There are times for having tea. There are times for having meals. And remember that... Uh, Nutrition is so important, and they don't always feel like eating or having this or having that or wanting to drink something. So things are really, especially in the beginning, can be so flexible. So nobody should just pitch up and knock on the door and say, here I am, I'm coming to see Anne and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work that way. So as the leader, I will then schedule the visits, and I will make sure that Anne is ready to receive whoever is then and coming to, to uh, make the visit. Then we must make sure as the leader of the group that I know what Anne's needs are. But not only Anne's needs, because remember, Anne may have a caretaker, and the caretaker be, may be a child, it may be a husband, it may be somebody from outside, another friend, uh, who is there on a permanent basis to be a, a, a caregiver. So we've got to know even what the needs of the caregiver is. Because we cannot, as a friend, only support Anne. As a true friend, we are there to support Anne, to pre support Anne's family, all of them, and also the caregiver is so important because, you know, caregiver burnout is such a reality. Yeah. And as a true friend, we must prevent Anne's caregiver to reach a point of, of burnout. And how do we do that? Is to make arrangements and say, separately with the, with the uh, caregiver, when would you like an afternoon off? And then we make arrangements again within our other little WhatsApp group, and we uh, make arrangements that uh, the caregiver will be off on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, guys, who of you will be available as caregiver on Wednesday afternoon? And we make arrangements like that so that the caregiver also has a chance. Remember, a caregiver cannot be on duty 24 hours a day. And it's a good thing that they also have a little time off. They've got private lives. They maybe have a family. Or even if they a, a family member, they just need a time to just be themselves. Being a caregiver, I can tell you, is not easy. How many of you have been a caregiver to a cancer patient? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's tiring. It can be exhausting. Yeah. Because you've got to be friendly all the time. You've got to be positive all the time. You've got to be supportive all the time, even though your heart may be breaking. And, uh, you know, it, this always makes me think, of, uh, there's a, a beautiful opera, and uh, what is it called? 
Um, I can't remember what it's called, but the, the, the aria that comes in there, it's called Recitar. And the whole story of this opera is a group of gypsies moving from town to town with a little caravan and they put up a show. And in the show that they put up night after night in each little town that they visit, Kaneo the clown, who is part of, he, well, he's like the, the main figure in, in this opera. And uh, he must get the people to laugh, etc. And in his own personal life, he's so unhappy. There are major problems between him and his wife. And it so happens that the story that they portray every night on night also features in the uh, show that they put up. And in the opera then, we reach the point where we see that Kanyo the Clown eventually just says, my heart is so broken. And he says, but I've got to laugh and I've got to be happy. And he laughs during the singing of the introduction to this aria. And then he says, you know, but nobody knows the heartache that I have in my heart. And he ends the aria. It's the most, one of the most beautiful arias. And he ends, really, and he cries. And a good dramatic tenor does really wonders with, with, with this. And think of Kanye the Cloud. So don't expect of people to always be, and as the caregiver to always be, be supportive so that they can also just have a little bit of time off and let off the steam and go and have a cry or just go and do whatever will help them to recharge their batteries. Then we must remember that our friend Anne is a member of a family or she may be living on her own and she will need somebody to help with shopping done. We've already mentioned a little bit of somebody assisting and helping with going to visit the, the uh, oncologist or the treating physician. And I'll say a little bit more about that just now. So remember the household's got to be kept going. And very often it's a dual role for the caregiver to keep the household running as well as keeping the patient going. And we've got to make sure that there is somebody that will help with cooking, with cleaning, mowing the lawn, uh, seeing that the laundry is done, washing up the dishes, etc. That the bills get paid, electricity is paid, uh, water and lights or whatever else needs to be paid. There may be a child who's still attending school and may be coming during the afternoon who needs somebody to help him or her with schoolwork. And these are the, all the things that the true friend, who's the leader of the little group of friends, must be able to see to. And say, guys, uh, Anne's youngest son, he's only 15. Uh, he's in uh, grade eight or whatever. I don't even know what age somebody is in grade eight. But he's 15, he's in grade eight. He needs extra help with his math. Uh, how many of you can, can, can be able to be available? And then we make arrangements with the son, when will it suit him best? All those little things, a true friend must know and have them on the tips of his or her fingers. Then when we go and visit, take a flask of whatever drink you know that Anne likes. Is it green tea? Is it rebus tea? Is it black tea? A tea with uh, sugar and milk or whatever the case may be. Uh, if there's a special little biscuit or cookie that she usually likes, take that with. So that when you get there, there's no interruption of having to go and make tea, etc. And that Anne can feel comfortable. And you even bring your little basket with two cups and saucers and teaspoons and whatever. And as you have your chat, you pour a nice tea or a coffee or whatever, the Milo, or whatever the case may be, and you have a wonderful visit. So bring that with you. Then we've already mentioned that this will assist in giving the caregiver a break. So the caregiver, when anybody comes to visit, doesn't have to interrupt looking after the, the, the laundry that needs doing, quickly now I have to go and make tea for, for a visitor. Then we've mentioned driving a patient to appointments. 
But apart from just driving the patient to appointments, it is good if a real good friend can accompany Anne when she visits her treating physician or oncologist. And to listen into what is being said, you arrange permission with the oncologist the treating physician. Look, I'm accompanying Anne at her request, and I'm here to assist her in listening to what you are saying. So that when we get home, we can go over the points again that uh, Anne doesn't forget anything. We must remember, cancer patients are very often anxious and they forget a lot of things. Um, I was uh, in the fortunate position to be a founding member of the International Kidney Cancer Foundation. It has its head office in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, we, through that, decided that we are going to do a research, a small research project. And we did, it was a double barrel little project. First of all, we contacted a whole lot of patients who were diagnosed with kidney cancer. And we tried to get the ones that were just newly diagnosed. And we interviewed them by telephone and asked them, what did the doctor or your oncologist or your treating physician tell you about your diagnosis, about your prognosis, about your treatment? Do you know that 95% plus of the cancer patients said, my doctor didn't tell me anything? Why? When people sit across a desk and the doctor says, you have cancer, they shut down immediately because even though they may be prepared for it, it's still the final word. Here it is. I've been afraid that this was going to be the case. And when you hear that, you just go cold and you don't hear anything. Yeah. So the patients, even though the doctor tells them, we then repeated our little research project. And we contacted oncologists who were treating patients with uh, kidney cancer and neurologists who were treating uh, cancer, patients with kidney cancer. And we asked them, what do they do? And some of them even uh, emailed through to us a little prospectus, a little schedule that they normally work from. How they explain to the patient what their particular type of kidney cancer is and what the best treatment would be. These are the options. But then remember, I'm not the one who's going to take the decision. You and I, as treating physician, will be talking to you as my patient. And between the two of us, we will decide what treatment will be best for you. And I can tell you that this is the case. It usually happens. But the patient doesn't hear this. And very often, even during a follow-up visit, they don't always hear some of the very important things that the treating physician wants to tell them or the oncologist tells them. So as the person who accompanies somebody to an appointment, even don't be shy. Say to the doctor, look, doctor, please excuse me, that, but I was just making a few little notes so that when Anne and I get back home, we will be able to, uh, to talk about this. Yeah. Are you going to excuse me for half a second? I just want to close the door no. because it's starting to rain and I'm going to corrugate it iron little veranda. And, uh, and I can hear it's making a noise in the background. Okay. One yeah. second. And I think, Nicole, that's the important part is, is as Prof saying, you know, to be able to, to assist the friend of, of the patient or the patient himself when they're at those consults, because we've mentioned this so many times before. Yeah. Where we say but, but you know what? I mean, that, that is also, you know, such a part of navigation. You know, um, it's not often that you're going to take a friend to your initial diagnosis. You know, it's normally, it's normally a loved one. And I think my whole argument on that is that it's probably better to have a navigator because they understand more. And then, like I say, is to prepare questions for the doctor or to take down notes or to record the session. Um, I've had this discussion with Carol, with Prof Ben and with, you know, Dr. Sereria. And I mean, I think, you know, as we know, um, and as Prof Herbst is saying, I mean, you, you don't, I mean, I can speak from personal experience that that, that afternoon when I heard I had breast cancer. I mean, 
the, the absolute shock, you know, and I mean, I had Chris with me and he does have a medical background. So, I mean, I've, you know, pretty much, and then, you know, I had, I had Carol and I mean, she, she was, um, she gave me a lot more information than I think a lot of surgeons might, or I wanted that information, but I mean, every patient handles, you know, that scenario differently too. And often they're so overwhelmed that I even want to look at, at look at information initially. And then as Prof. saying, I think with the follow-up, um, even at the follow-up. So I think it's, it's so important to be able to sit down with the patient and then go over everything with them and with the family, because often, you know, if it is a friend or a family member and they don't understand much about cancer themselves, I mean, I think that is a barrier in itself, just a friend who doesn't understand, um, whereas a navigator, you know, ha you know, has the background to, to be able to explain to the family member, the patient, the friend more, you know, um, yeah. that's just my, my, my take. <laughs> Nicole, you are so right. And yeah. very often, you know, with the first visit, when the patient gets the diagnosis, they're usually on their own, uh, unless yeah. a, a spouse or a life partner will be available to go with them. But very often, mm -hmm. the patient will be there on his or her own. Uh, uh, so no, they exactly. can't do anything. And that is why the follow-up visit is so important, so as important. you mentioned. Yeah. And then to take somebody with. Because somebody's going to accompany you, is going to drive yeah. you there and accompany you, and then provide the oncologist or the treating physician an opportunity to now talk to the patient when he or she yeah. will be able to hear and take in more, but you go and take notes and make sure that when we get home, I can go over all this with Anne again, and we can make sure that Anne knows exactly yeah. the what, and the where, and the why nots. Yeah. No, exactly. So right. Yeah, and when they're ready to, to actually absorb more of the information, you know, it, it just it sometimes takes a little while for it to sink in. And I mean, I see I had a patient with Prof Ben two, week, two weeks ago was diagnosed and I've been, you know, helping her navigate now. And she, she's absolutely terrified because she had a, she's got a, her mom died of breast cancer. You know, and now she's been diagnosed and she was worried about a genetic link, you know, and I said to her, but, you know, obviously it's in your file and you must, Prof Ben must have brought it up with you and she said to me Nicole that, that you know it was it was the, her first that, you know it was a um, visit when she was diagnosed and she said Prof Ben spoke so quickly that I didn't take in half of the information and you know often the oncologists are rushed and you know then I you know said to her okay you know we can talk about it once you know um you have your next follow-up and everything's been, you know, you've got your treatment plan and your prognosis and going forward. But I mean, it, it's just wrong with me. And I, I actually want to tell Carol that, you know, that, you know, and I mean, she's under so much pressure, especially at Helen Joseph and, you know, when it's government because, you know, she's under even, there's just so many patients that she needs to get through in, in, in that. She knows yeah. there are 15 patients still waiting to be seen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. No, but it just rang, you know, yeah. How many of you have seen the Helen Josephs when the people come in to see, like, a, a, a Ross, uh, Carol Ben? Well, I work there, so I know very well. <laughs> you know what it looks like. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That is so, so important. And it, it's lovely for you to, to bring this into the conversation. And for yeah. anybody who afterwards will be listening to this conversation, to get personal experience of uh, what happens at a consulting room. It's not that the doctor is rushing and that you're not important enough and that they don't want to spend time with you. Yeah. There are yeah. hundreds more patients who've got to be seen during the course of this week. Exactly. And yeah. 15, 20. And remember that uh, the oncologist is not there all day and every day. They've got a session. And during the session, yeah. they've got to see all the patients that have come in for an appointment. And they may yeah. only have 20 minutes or maximum of 30 minutes per patient. Otherwise, they will not be able to uh, chat to, to and, and have a consultation with everyone. Yeah, no, okay. yeah. yeah. So that's important to remember. Anything else you want to tell us about what happens there in, in, in the area? Well, you, you know, a, a very interesting point. I, I'm also navigating uh, um, the daughter of one of um, um, Prof Ben's elderly patients who was diagnosed in November. And she's, you know, in her 80s and she's in a wheelchair and she has a cardiac um, 
she has cardiomyopathy and she has diabetes. So, I mean, she's got comorbidities and she started her treatment at Charlotte Makeke in January. And I mean, the daughter has been absolutely horrified by what goes on there, you know, and she says they're actually, um, you know, they're rude and they, they haven't got time and they treat her mom badly. And, you know, we've had to try and explain to her that, look, sometimes the staff, I must admit, are quite rude, um, but they, under, you know, to explain to her how much pressure they under, and like you say, the oncologists at Charlotte are also in private practice, they have limited time. You know, they, they, I think they're seeing now between 80 and 120 patients in one day for chemo treatment there. So you can imagine how overwhelmed they are and they're understaffed and the, the staff are under pressure and on top of it, there's COVID. So I said to her, you know, you've got to realize too, you've got to just try and be as patient as you can. But, um, you know, I, I agree that no, they don't need to be rude, but um, I think she, uh, often these patients expect, you know, they, they expect more than can be given in this in the in the systems of, of our government health system because it's so fractured, you know. And they don't understand that. And she thinks her mother is the only one and the very special one. And you know, so you know, um Louise who heads up breast health, she said to me, Nicole, you need to explain to her that it's 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 also the system. It's not just you know, it's just not her mom alone. She's not in, pri even in private practice. I mean, we know Donald Gordon, I can wait for four hours to see Prof. Demetrio when I have my checkup because I have to wait for the chemo patients who are in treatment. You know, I'm not having chemo. I'm just having a follow-up. But And they, they are priority because they are going through treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I think the staff also, though, need to be more, they need to say to, you know, explain to the patients the circumstances and try not be rude and say, listen, we're under huge pressure when, you know, we were, we're doing as best as we can. And I think there's also a lot of communication that can be handled better, you know, if, if they explain the situation better to the patients. You know, um, Thank you, Nicole. You know, you've brought yeah. me to something else that I have later on in my list, but I think it's now the time to talk about that. Because when you mention the word, it's COVID as well at the moment. We mm -hmm. remember that very often cancer patients are admitted. Yeah. Or they have to be admitted for a few days with the initial treatment very often. And yeah. no visit is allowed. Because yeah. we know because of COVID, no visit is allowed. Because mm -hmm. especially not with the cancer patient who will now have his or her immune system further compromised with yeah. treatment and as a result of the disease, et cetera, et cetera. And this brings me, and we were talking about Anne just now, and we took it for granted that Anne was a patient at home. Um, yeah. Now I want to put Anne in the hospital bed. Yeah, exactly. And none of us can go and visit go in. Anne. But what about the family members? And yeah. this is where the same group has the responsibility to have a one-on-one -on -one with the head of the family even if it's a child-headed household, yeah. to have a one on one of them to hear what their needs are, when it will suit every one of us because they will know us. We are the friends of the, the family. When it will suit them for us to go and visit, what their needs are. Is there a child that needs transport in the morning to go to school and to be brought back? Uh, whatever. And again, the whole process that we spoke about earlier with Anne in bed at home, comes back with Anne in the hospital because now the family members need um, our additional support. Because remember, now they are so anxious. They are so fatigued because of worry and concern because they cannot go and visit mom Anne. Yeah, exactly. And we now have to give support to them. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it, it doubles the load. I can tell you it does. Yeah. yeah. No, and, you know, I think, you know, even patients just, you know, going in for their chemo, you know, as an outpatient for the day, I mean, they will say how hard it's been, you know, that they've now got to go into chemo alone because, you know, norm, you know, in normal times, you know, they could have a friend or a, a loved one or their husbands accompany them and it, it does make such a difference. And, you mean, you know, you feel so alone and you're so anxious, you know, going through the chemo alone i mean i think radiation is a bit different because you can't be accompanied you go in and it's done and you leave but with chemo you know i think a lot of patients are taking huge strain look unfortunately like at charlotte with this um with this older older lady they have allowed her daughter to go with her because she's in a wheelchair and you know i mean she cannot cope by herself 
but um, you know, they've they've been quite rude to them, you know, in the process. Look, I think the the daughter's a little bit demanding too, um, you know, and I've had to say to her, you know, you need to just understand, you know, um, and at least they are allowing her to go with her mom, um, because her mom is, you know, in the wheelchair and, and can't get around by herself, you know. Thank you for that, Nicole. I still want to keep Anne in the hospital bed. Or no, let's take Anne out of the hospital bed and say that Anne is one of the people who are making use of the services in the uh, oncology unit as a patient coming in for her chemotherapy treatment. And I want to now say to you that uh, I would like to see the nursing staff that you made mention of just now as the caregivers during yeah. that period and this is where the nice thing comes in i am the one who agreed that i will take Anne today for her chemo i will accompany her uh, because her uh, husband is working uh, he, he cannot get off work and etc so i will take her and then amongst the group i would say you know the nursing staff are such wonderful people and even if they aren't remember they are under a lot of pressure, especially in the government service, because we know what the problems are, understaffing, overworked, etc., etc. And in the group, we decide, oh, let's prepare something. You know, normally, if I can remember correctly, you know, uh, if I remember, you know, there are seven nurses usually on duty. That's what my experience now there in a particular unit. And then I say to you, well, what seven tiny little things can we prepare amongst ourselves for me to take with on Tuesday morning when I take Anne for her next uh, chemotherapy round. And then just give this tiny little gift, be it uh, just a tiny little slab of chocolate, uh, an energy bar, uh, just not an energy drink, because I don't think that's the most healthy thing to, to, to give to somebody because it's got such a lot of caffeine in it. You know, something nice. Or to take... Um, seven pears or seven apples or seven bananas or whatever. And you, it needn't be, uh, you know, a whole bag of biltong because it, it's not the money. It is the mere uh, showing appreciation. Yeah. Take something with and give to the caregivers and just to give each of them yeah. something. If it's no, close to, to Valentine's Day, just a nice yeah. little a carnation with a a little red bow on it, and you dish it out to the staff. That is so important. Yeah. It makes the staff feel important. They feel yeah. recognized. They feel appreciated. And then they, they're just energized for the rest of the day. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, that's what I said to her. I said, you know, Zita, if you're going to complain all the time and you're going to get your back up, it's just going to make them more angry. And, and when they see you and your mom, you know, that, you know, she, she's, con you know, she's convinced that they, they're doing it on purpose. They're making her mother wait. And you know, I don't think she understands, you know, the, the system, but I mean, if she was more pleasant, um, you know, they would be more pleasant, uh, you know, and I said to her, you know, you need to realize that, you know, um, yeah. Okay, let's carry on because we now have only about another 20 minutes. So uh, let's, let's get the moving on. But this is Professor Hurt. Can I ask a question? Thanks. Yes, please. Good question. Just, just, I know we're going to run out of time going through all 25 points. And I'm hoping, no, that, I don't need to and I'm hoping that we'll be able to catch up with you again. I just wanted to ask you quickly if I take you back a step, what happens if you've got a cancer patient that does not want to be, to be visited? That, ha that is mentally very down and withdrawn and prefers to be alone. How do we deal with something like that? Thank you very much. That is such a crucial and important question. Yes. Here again, it will need that we, as a true friend, need to know the family circumstances. Is there a husband? Is there a life partner? Is there a boyfriend? Is there an, an older sibling that is sort of, you know, uh, responsible for the household, etc.? Yeah. and to get into contact with that individual and to find out from that individual, look, how best do you see us eventually making contact with Anne? Use that as, as, as a lever and let them inform you uh, when it will suit better. 
And then that brings me to my next point that I want to say what we've got to do. And it fits in beautifully with your question. Amongst the group, we prepare a little, call it a basket, call it a, a, a box or whatever you want to, an activity, something. In that, have little messages and each little message or each little something special, be it a Bible verse, be it a nice little poem, or just a special message. You know, we are praying and thinking of you today. Prepare this with a date on each of them. And put them in the little basket, put them in the little box, and then even give this to the uh, uh, important member of the, of the family that you're using to make contact with Anne. And let him or her then give this to Anne and say, this comes from all your friends. Something for every day. And uh, together we will open each day's little message. And on the little message, you give the names of the little group of friends so that Anne will know this is just not a message that comes out of the air. It comes from Peter, John, Susan, uh, Catherine, or whatever. Seven little names of the, the group at the bottom. And that, again, will remind Anne of how important she still is. And she will say, oh, you know, even though I don't want to see anybody, they are still thinking of me. And eventually, Anne will become a little bit more accepted as and starts to get into a position of more accepting her diagnosis, more uh, feeling okay with what is happening, less angry because you know it, it, it's like losing a loved one. You go through this whole phase. Why me? Why my loved one? And you know you go through this whole process of bereavement until you come to total acceptance. And this is true for a cancer patient as well. Because you ask, why must I be diagnosed? I've got young children. I, you know, they, they need me every day of their lives. Why me? And, and you get angry, you get upset, and you, you don't want to accept the whole situation. But we remind Anne every day when she gets an, an, uh, the message for today, the 17th of March. And she gets a beautiful little Bible verse there. If, of course, that person is a Christian, and that is something that we've got to keep in mind as well. If somebody is, is a Muslim, don't send them, a, 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 you know, a, a Bible verse from the Christian Bible. Then do what I do. I have in my possession a Quran. And uh, I actually got the Quran when I was doing my uh, doctoral research. And because uh, when I was interviewing uh, two young men who were uh, Muslims, they said to me, you know, Prof, clearly you don't know what the Quran says. And I said, I am very honest with you, I don't know. And they said, you know, go to Pretoria. Uh, if I remember, it's, man, is it Blood Street? But there's a, a beautiful... A uh, shop there, and uh, they sell a whole lot of material and whatever. And they open every day of the year, even Sundays and every public holiday they open, and they sell Quran. And I bought myself a beautiful white Quran, and it's got the Arabic version on the right hand side, and on the left page is the uh, recognised English translation of the Quran. And if it's somebody who's you've got a Muslim friend, get a Quran. And there are most beautiful messages in there. I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of truth in the messages in the Quran. And if you read the Quran, so many chapters, and from chapter upon chapter, is equivalent to the Christian Bible. It tells you the whole story of Abraham and everything else. And even the, the whole story, it tells you the story of Jesus. It's in there. Go and get it. So for a friend, who's then a Muslim, get the Quran and send a little message from the Quran. And you say, Quran chapter so-and-so, verse so-and-so, because they work in, in chapters and verses, and uh, you do that. It is absolutely incredible what this will do to the person, and especially for the person that you are saying now, who is still in that phase where he or she 
does not want to receive visitors. But they get these beautiful messages with a little list of, of all the close friends, and that person will eventually change it. But don't have messages for seven days and then stop. Once you start this, make sure that between the group, you always have, before the last message is read on the 17th of March today, that you have delivered the next little basket or the next little box with the next week or the next 10 days little messages in them. And don't stop. Even if you start visiting, still so continue with that. It, I can tell you it is something wonderful. The uh, per person on a cancer journey gets so used to this and they, they do this then the first thing when they wake up in the morning say, I can't wait to see what today's message is all about. It makes such a difference in the life of the cancer patient. Yeah. Make little gifts. We're getting close to winter now. So in the lady groups, those who do crochet work, those who do knitting work, knit a scarf, beautiful, lovely scarf, favorite color or whatever. Knit a pair of, of, of uh, socks that person can wear even during when they're in bed or when they're sitting outside. A crochet, a nice little knee blanket that when Anne is sitting outside watching a little bit of TV or listening to the radio or sitting reading a book that she can have this over her knees and keep her legs warm. You know, little things like this that are practical uh, that is so important. Also remember, if you're visiting a Christian friend, a prayer is always welcome. So you're not trying to, to pretend to be the man of the cloth or the minister of the congregation. Yeah. But you say, Anne, would you mind if we just talk to God just for a few seconds? Yeah. And really talk to God. Don't make it a formal prayer and say, oh, dear Father, which art in heaven, you know, hallowed be the... You know, talk and say, God, I'm sitting here with Anne. And doesn't feel as happy today as she would want to be. God, what can we do? What can you do to be present in Anne's heart, to make her feel loved, to make her aware that there are many people outside, apart from her family members, who want her as a friend and who still want her in their lives for years to come? Talk to God. Talk to Anne. That is, is, is how it is. And you know where I got this from? Those of you that don't know, I'm in a same-sex relationship. And uh, the day we sent love to each other, it was a lesbian minister. She was a qualified minister. And she made us say our vows in her home. And she prayed like that. Wow. And I never heard it in my life before. Sure. And I think back of the time when I promised Billy, yeah. till death us to part. Just that little prayer, talking. So don't make it a prayer where you're sermonizing or whatever. Yeah. Talk to God and ask God to be present. In my life and God, please be with Anne. Yeah. Mention the names and mention God by name. Yeah. Dear Jesus, dear God, whoever you, how you prefer to talk. That is so, so important. It is something that the patient will never forget for his or her life. That little word of prayer that was said that just gives them strength. And I can tell you there's scientific research that shows people, cancer patients, who have spirituality, and I'm not talking religion, yeah. but cancer patients who have spirituality in their lives, they do 10, 20, 50 times better than a patient without spirituality. Nicole, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I agree fully because I think, you know, so many patients, um, you, you may not be really religious, but I mean, you know, I'm just talking from, from my own perspective, I mean, I almost get a spirituality because, you know, I'm a runner. So, I mean, running is, I love running. I'm addicted to running. But, I mean, for me to 
to be running in the morning and see a sunrise. It's almost a whole spiritual connection when, you know, I can stand and see that sunrise and sort of connect with God. I mean, you know, so people, you know, find, you know, it doesn't have to be specifically religion. People, um, you know, need to find their own spirituality, as you say, um, you know, and I think that is so important. And like you said, it makes a big difference mentally, you know, to the patient. You know? Yeah. You know, again, I want to use uh, uh, a Muslim friend. Uh, if you want to leave, I mean, it's it's not for me as a Christian to, to pray for a Muslim friend. But for my Muslim friend, I will say, dear Anne, you know, I firmly believe that Allah, may his name be blessed, will be with you. There's nothing wrong for a Christian to say that to a Muslim friend. Yeah. They will so appreciate it. You are recognizing me because I am a Muslim. I don't have the same belief that you have, but we both have spirituality in our lives. Yeah. And that is so important. And you can feel free to say to Anne, because you know Anne so well, and you can say to Anne, Anne, may Allah, and blessed be his name, may Allah be with you. May you be blessed in your life until we see again and you make arrangements for when the next meeting will be. Professor, we've got about five minutes left. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. If not, just Yeah, then maybe, you know, uh, stay connected. I think that is for my conclusion. Stay connected. And when I mean stay connected, it need not, well, it mustn't only be stay connected with your, your cancer friend. Stay connected with his or her family, his or her caregiver. Stay connected with them all so that you will always be aware of what the needs are, what the circumstances are, so that amongst our other little friend group of friends, we will always be prepared to step in and provide the support, the love, the care, and everything that they may need. And then uh, at the end, I want to apologize and say, you may have noticed my very long hair. Uh, uh, if you people know me, I've never had hair this long, but at my age, I still don't see myself comfortable to go to a barber shop and to have that closeness. Because when I listen to the news and I hear, and unfortunately they always only mention the name of important people, but whenever they mention the name of an important person who's 60, 65, 70, and so years old, who passed away because of COVID complications, I said to myself, Michael, you're 76. Yeah. So please take care of yourself. God's been so good to you. Uh, don't worry about your hair that is so long. So apologies for my hair that is so long. I will one day, maybe have a little bit of a ponytail until I will go and, and, and have a haircut when I feel safe yeah. or when I have a friend that I, I know who can cut my hair uh, that I feel comfortable about having that him, him or her so close to me. And then uh, the last little thing before I say goodbye and thank you to you all is sorry for my emotional reaction just now, but uh, I will share with you one day why I still get very emotional about the promise that I made to Billy, because he's so important to my life and he so much needs my care and attention at the moment, because he's had two very bad spells of brain infection, which has severely infected him. He's lost vision and, uh, you know, he's, he's got no short term memory and things like that. And uh, he's special to me still today. And I can think back of the wonderful experience we had going to this wonderful uh, minister's home and letting us say our vows to each other and her just beautifully talking to God and saying, you know, dear God, here's Michael, here's Billy, please be with them. And I'm apologizing again for my little bit of emotional outburst. No, not at all. Not at all, Professor. It's really important for us, you know, to, to ensue that spirit of Philotimo um, every single day. And that's why we love to have you on because you, you're real and uh, 
you know, we can relate to you. And I think people who are going through this journey, no matter whether you're the cancer sufferer yourself or a family member or friend, yeah. your compassion and your empathy has to be there. And it only comes through when you're living your true integrity. You know, you're not putting on a face, you're sharing your emotions, you're being honest with each other. And I think that's what gets everybody through. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've walked at the cancer walk as well. I mean, my late wife who died uh, just over 20 years ago, she died of, of, of liver cancer. So I, I walked a bit of the walk of, of cancer and she was my best friend. She was the mother of my children. She was my, my, really my best friend, my everything. And when God took her away from me, uh, there was just no place for, for another woman in my life. And all my life, I've been uh, orientated more towards always be a little bit gay in my life, although I was very faithful to my wife. And when she was gone uh, and Billy came into my life, I mean, that was just it. And I thank God for sending Billy into my life as well. Yeah, sure. it's, it's absolutely just wonderful to, to have him in my life. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Philotimo, Cancer Project, Evie, you people, please. Thank you very much for having me again. It was wonderful to chat to you. Uh, uh, Nicole, thank you to you. I see Bobby Weir has joined us in the meantime. Deshni, thank you. And there's also Drika who joined us. Please, you've missed as part of, of the presentation. Please go to Facebook and listen to the rest. There's wonderful interaction that occurred between myself and Nicole, who is a, a cancer patient navigator, and she had a lot to share with us as well. Thank you very, very much. God bless you all. Go well, stay safe from COVID. And be good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, on that note, um, I'd also want to just make mention for those that are looking to um, give a gift to a friend, as Professor Herbst mentioned earlier, um, and doing something in return for a cancer patient and or their family, please have a look on our website under our shop. Um, there are vouchers that our partner, Michelle Goldner, has on our website that entitles... Um, a cleaning service of the house um, of a patient that's going through cancer or treatment. Um, so you can have a look at that, something that you can send to your friends on our website under our shop section. And um, before I end off, I'd like to thank our, our pride sponsors from BMW Bryanston, um, who sponsored this uh, webinar for us today. So a huge thank you to, and shout out to them. And uh, yeah, next week, another webinar. We're going to be chatting a little bit about uh, colon and um, hydrotherapy and all of that coming. So very exciting. All those details will be uh, shared from our partner that's joining us from Azura Health. So have a look out for that. But other than that, from our side, once again, huge thank you. And uh, please keep safe. We see you all next week, Wednesday, same time, same place. Sending you lots of love always. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.